But first, we got to start off with healthcare, right? Because people often come to me and they're a bit frustrated, right? They've been from doctor to doctor to doctor, um, seeking solutions for all kinds of illnesses and not really having any success with these things, right? So the question is why, right? Um, is it just that doctors really don't want to help you? Are they like, you know, kind of malicious or they don't like you or they don't care about their job or is it something else? Um, because it, it has come to my attention that it is a common belief that uh, doctors don't want to help you, right? Because they don't, they don't have an interest in, you know, providing permanent solutions to things that ail you and whatnot. And that may not actually be the case. It may be the case for some, right? I would imagine a small number, but it isn't really the case at large. So first, in order to understand why that's the case, you gotta go back. Let's go back. Let's give a hypothetical. You want to help people through nutrition. So you decide, I'm gonna go to college. I'm gonna go to university and I'm gonna get my degree and nutrition and dietetics, get my bachelor's degree, get my master's degree, become a board certified nutritionist, right? Now, if you agree to go to university or college, you are consenting to conforming to the institutions that are educating you. You can't just go and just do things your own way, right? You're going through the institution, you have to do it the way that the institutions tell you to do it. So what happens is the institutions and those who lead the institution, well, there's a lot of money behind them, right? If you give a systemic analysis of how power works, and particularly in our society, power is largely uh, run through those with the most money. The ones with the most money have the most power, have the most influence. The ones with the most money are going to be um, those who are the owners or C-suites of your largest, most profitable corporations, right? The ones who control the banks, the big corporate interests, and then they buy off politicians, they buy off those or plant um, people who work for them inside other institutions, right? So let's say you have the hospitals Right? and the owners of the hospitals, and they're friends with those who own the health insurance companies and run the health insurance companies. And they're friends with the ones who own and run pharma companies, right? The, the, the most profitable pharmaceutical companies, right? And the pharmaceutical industry. They all know each other, right? Big money, they know each other. The biggest players at the table, right? The billionaires, they all know each other. They're friends with each other. They go out to eat with each other. They have meetings with each other. They fly all around the world to meet with each other, right? That type of thing. They're friends. They make money together. Now, if you want to work for them, you got to do things their way. And if you're coming out of college, well, who's going to be setting the curriculum for what you learn in college? top down so they're going to have a big hand in what you learn and they're going to want to dictate how you do things in large part you get a little wiggle room here and there but for the most part they want to make sure that you don't stray off the reservation so to speak as they like to put it <clears throat> so they're going to be dictating what's acceptable what you can do what you can right First of all, in order to get your degrees, you got to take tests. You got to repeat back to them what they taught you so that you can get the green light. And for you to get registered, you got to jump through some hoops and whatnot. You get registered. And then in order for you to practice, you got to meet certain guidelines. Those guidelines are then set in combination with your corporate owners and your political class. And they work together and they form policy. And that policy dictates what kind of regulations you have to go to. And guess who those regulations suit? Right? The ones who own the big capital interests, right? If you want to practice certain types of medicine, you have to practice it in a way where the health insurance companies will feel comfortable insuring it. 
right? Health insurance companies pick and choose. Uh, we'll give you, uh, we'll give you X amount of coverage for this. We're not covering that. All right. And this is pretty much how it rolls. So you're subordinate. So you decide you're gonna work as a nutritionist, a dietitian. You're subordinate to the guidelines that the big corporate interests set. And you cannot work against them. You have to work with them under their rules. Now, why is this important? There's a such thing called a zero sum game, meaning in order for you to win, someone else has to lose. Right, that's zero sum. And if you lose, that necessarily means someone else is winning. Zero sum, right? So let's take preventative medicine and chronic illness reversal. That's on one hand. On the other side, there is illness treatment and there is profit, right? And treatment is very profitable. Okay, so you got a chronic illness, you wanna treat the chronic illness and you wanna treat the chronic illness as long as possible. If you treat that chronic illness for as long as possible, well, guess what? The longer the treatment goes on, the more money you make from treating it, right? So you treat some type of chronic illness with a medication. The person takes the medication, they consume it, and they go for refill after refill after refill, right? And over time, as they get older, right, we just tack on more medication. So maybe you start with one or two, then you end up with three or four, then five or six, then seven, etc. You have a whole bunch of bottles in your medicine cabinet by the time you're 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, right? And if they can get you for a surgery, well, then let's throw a surgery in there. That's a lot of money too, and that'll do well for the hospital, et cetera, and bring in big money, right? Preventative medicine reduces the likelihood of chronic illness. So now this reduces the potential profit to treat illness, which means, well, less revenue, less profit. If you are practicing in a way that produces chronic illness reversal, well, now you're cutting the treatment short because now you can't treat an illness if you've reversed it. It's gone. You don't have it no more. They're out. But now there's going to be an absence in potential profit there. So preventative medicine and chronic illness reversal undercuts corporate profits. Zero sum. If it was normal for our doctors and our board certified nutritionists and things like that, if it was normal and largely practiced for them to engage in preventive medicine and chronic illness reversal, that would obliterate corporate profits to a significant degree. You'd have a healthier population, but you'd have a lot less profit funneling into the health insurance companies, funneling into the pharmaceutical companies, funneling into the hospitals, etc. You have a healthier population and you have less money being spent on healthcare. Right? Your doctors may not even really know this or be cognizant of it. It's kind of like, um, how police in the United States are known for police brutality. It's culture, it's institution. When you go through the institution, the deeper you get into the institution, you surrender to the institution. And the next thing you know, you're practicing certain behaviors that you may not necessarily have been doing before. It's insidious, right? it kind of creeps in. The next thing you know, the system has you and you're engaging in brutality unnecessarily as a police officer, right? It's not really the individuals, it's the system itself that really you gotta put the onus on. <clears throat> Your doctor is not really allowed to practice, you know, reversing chronic illnesses or preventative healthcare. They're not trained to do that. They're not really, it's not in the culture, right? Western, especially with Western medicine largely driven by profit, it's not in the culture, right? They got to get you on the amlodipine, the hydrochlorothiazide. They got to get you on the beta blockers, right? They got to get you on the steroids, the hormone replacements, the diuretics, 
right? They got to get you on the antidepressants, the SSRIs, these types of things, right? Get you on the medications, keep you on the medications. And if you ask, well, how long do I have to take this medication? You're more than likely going to get an answer of, well, let's see how things go. Or, well, you know, we, we can't really determine that right now. We'll just keep an eye on it. There's no time frame. The reason why is because the answer is you ain't getting off. There's no intent to get you off. There's no deadline. There's no, there's no solution. They keep you in the game, but you're not going to win. Right? Ultimately, the natural conclusion, you know, often leads to, let's say, kidney disease and dialysis. Right? Which is often the case for a lot of our population. I've spoken to enough doctors to know that they don't even really realize the things that I'm even saying. They don't really notice. <clears throat> because not everybody's going to engage in this kind of systemic analysis. I may be hyper aware of it because I just think like that. It doesn't, I don't think it makes me special. I think a lot of people think like this. Which is why you'll have a lot of doctors who decide they're going to do things in an entirely different way. And they're going to open a private practice and do things fundamentally different. And health insurance companies are not covering what they do. Holistic practitioners, things like that. And unfortunately for them, you had to go to them and pay them out of pocket. Which is a bit of a confirmation of what I'm saying, or a big confirmation of what I'm saying. <clears throat> in the United States in particular, 18% of our GDP is spent on healthcare spending. It's a huge amount. Enormous amount of money. The amount of money that uh, health insurance brings in uh, that accounts for our GDP is like in between six and eight percent. Significant. That's just health insurance. When you factor in hospitals and pharmaceuticals and whatnot, it's much greater than that. So if you undercut the profits, this is going to uh, have a very negative impact on uh, the stock market. And that will hurt GDP. It'll hurt the stock market. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of political pressure that the donors are going to apply onto our political class as a result. This is very destabilizing. If you, had a, if you get a healthier population, it would literally hurt these sectors of our economy just by having a healthier population. Right. Just having a healthier population would hurt profits of the institutions that we rely on, that we call health care. Right. People often call it a sick care system. <clears throat> I don't know if it necessarily was intended to be this way from the beginning, but it definitely became this way. And you can say that this is a critique of capitalism, which is our economic model that we have here, right? That would be valid, right? Because the system is organized for profit. Obviously, if it was organized, if our healthcare system was organized to produce the best health results or the best health outcomes, well, that would be a massive failure, right? Because the more money we spend on our healthcare, that goes parallel to worse outcomes. We get worse outcomes, we spend more money, and then worse outcomes, even more so, and then more money and worse outcomes. It's just going in the wrong direction. What we should see is if we put more money into our healthcare system, we should be seeing better outcomes, not worse. Right, so things are trending in the wrong direction. It's almost like getting a uh, healthier population is not the goal. Right? But the profits are, are going in, in the right direction. The system obviously organized for profits, and this is how this works. Right? So this would really demonstrate to you why what I tell you to do may be extremely different from what your nutritionist or your doctor tells you to do. So for example, if you have diabetes, type two diabetes, you go to your doctor and your doctor says, make sure 
we're going to cut back your carbohydrates and try to avoid fruit because fruit has, is high in sugar. So you want to avoid fruit as much as possible because of the sugar, right? And eat more protein. They'll tell you eat more protein, eat less carbs and avoid fruit because of the sugar. They'll never tell you about the glycemic index. Well, I won't say never, but they hardly ever tell you about the glycemic index. They never talk about glycemic load. They never even talk about the benefits of fruit uh, uh, in your diet and how it improves insulin sensitivity and reverses type 2 diabetes. They never tell you about it. There's plenty of empirical data. There's plenty of statistical and epidemiological data that would demonstrate that, but they just they don't really tell you about it. All right. Um, and you can't have people telling the truth about what actually causes type 2 diabetes. Because if you did, well, um, that would undercut the profits of uh, animal agriculture, which is our largest like agricultural industry. Right? So all of that meat, dairy, and eggs, and all this type of stuff, those are big money makers. And if it becomes common knowledge that the primary driver of mitochondrial uh, dis disorder and insulin resistance is saturated fat and excess protein, guess what happens? People are going to go, oh, for real, so if I'm a diabetic, I should avoid these things? Or if I'm insulin resistant, I should avoid these things? Or if I have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, I should avoid these things? Or if I have kidney disease, I should consume less protein and avoid animal products? and lower the amount of oxidative stress going on in my liver and my kidneys as a result of these things. Oh, I should stop cooking with the palm oil and all of this type of stuff. Oh, the dairy consumption actually puts your kids at risk for developing type 1 diabetes. If, you, if you're a pregnant woman, uh, a pregnant mother or a pregnant woman and you're consuming dairy, you can in, you increase the likelihood of your kids having uh, chronic illnesses, one of them being type 1 diabetes. If this was common general knowledge in our population, guess how much that would hurt the profit margins of these industries? Right? So it's not really talked about. It's easy to demonize sugar because it's already addicting anyway. Right? So people say, oh, you gotta cut sugar out of your diet as much as possible. That's easy to say because it's addicting. It's kind of like, Tobacco companies do very well with selling cigarettes and all of that type of stuff, and everybody knows cigarettes are well, do, or, you know, cigarettes are terrible. You got plenty of people smoking cigarettes, and cigarette companies make a ton of money because it's addicting. Right? You can have an opioid epidemic even though people know, hey, this stuff is terrible for your health and it'll destroy your life. When it's addicting, you can say whatever you want about it, you can't get people, people off of it. However, when it comes to like meat, dairy, and eggs, not so much. It doesn't have that addictive effect. People don't even actually like the taste of meat. People don't like the taste of meat. People don't really, people don't like the taste of eggs. People don't like the taste of these things. And I know people don't like the taste of these things because if, I, because if you were to say to me, if I tell you, you don't like the taste of chicken, and you say, well, yeah, like, I like the taste of chicken. I'm like, oh, word, what I want you to do is get a chicken breast and boil it and eat it unseasoned. And the first thing that would come to your mind is, ah, I'm not doing that. That's disgusting. Oh, you like the taste of eggs? Crack an egg, swallow the yolk whole. Ugh, it's disgusting. Even if you boil an egg, you eat egg whites. This isn't, ooh, yummy, tasty, hard-boiled eggs. Doesn't taste good. All right? We eat these things culturally. So, if you want to know who's in power, guess who you get in trouble for talking about? All right? You can't talk about them. Even there's certain things here on this platform that we call YouTube, there's certain things you can't talk about because they'll pull your channel down, right? You get, real, you get funny about certain things. You gotta pay attention to that. So, 
moral of the story is it's not really your doctor's fault whether they give you bad information they've been given bad information question is who's giving the bad information who's responsible for giving the bad information the head of the systems is the one that's producing these outcomes we live in a we live in a top-down system right? so you got to take a magnifying glass and take it to the ones that are at the top of the system and that's that's a systemic analysis that's a, that, that's what gives us a clearer understanding of what's going on